What happened to Charles I's corpse after his execution in 1649? Who treated him with respect and who desecrated him? What gruesome thing did Oliver Cromwell supposedly do when he saw the body? And what super famous monarch was the king buried with? How were his remains supposedly lost? How were they found? What condition were they in? Who stole pieces of him? And what happened to those bits? Spoiler alert, there's a story that something absolutely insane happened to one of his bones. This is History Calling, where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. And today I bring you one which includes such phrases as defiled the body, perverted pleasure and coffin goop as we look at the sometimes shocking treatment of the remains of the king who lost his head to the parliamentarians. Charles I is, I think, most famous as the king who was deposed by a group of his own people, led by Oliver Cromwell, after a long and brutal series of civil wars had torn the British Isles apart during the 1640s. After he was tried for treason and found guilty, he was sentenced to death and executed at Banqueting House in London on the afternoon of Tuesday the 30th of January 1649. The story of that day is well known. From the king asking to be allowed to wear two shirts so he wouldn't shiver from the cold and be thought to be afraid, to his swift execution by a single stroke of the axe, to the supposed scramble by many of the onlookers to dip their handkerchiefs in his blood to keep his relics. That's not what this video is about, however. Instead, the end of Charles's life is just the starting point of today's story, which will look at what happened to his decapitated corpse in the hours, days, and eventually centuries after his death. Before I dig in, if you love history and want more, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel with the notification bell switched on so that YouTube lets you know when I upload. You can also switch on the subtitles for my videos if you like using the CC, short for closed captions, button as shown here and even translate them into a language of your choice using the little gear icon next to it. For more from me, why not follow me on Instagram too, which is linked in the description box for you, as is my Patreon page. We have several contemporary or near contemporary accounts of what happened immediately after the king was killed. Dr. George Bate, who was Charles's physician, tells us in his book, Alentius Motum Nuperorum in Anglia, originally published in Latin in 1649, though I'm using a 1688 translation, that as soon as the king was dead, his martyred body was dishonoured, because those present, quote, wash their hands and dip their sticks in his blood, set to seal the block cut to pieces, and the sand underneath it moistened with royal blood, and make money also of his hair. He went on to say that these tokens, if you want to call them that, were bought up by people for various reasons, including a desire to have dear pledges and relics of a prince whom they adored, or, less honourably, so that they might have and show in triumph the spoils of their enemy. Now, the crowds had been deliberately held back by soldiers at the time of the execution, so much so that the king had to address his final speech to those men who were on the scaffold with him, as the onlookers were too far away to hear him. So I struggle to believe that they would have been allowed to reach his blood to make relics of it, and I certainly don't think any but those who were on the scaffold with him could have cut off his hair. Perhaps Beit is saying that it was those attending on the king in his final moments, or the soldiers present, who made relics of parts of his remains, then sold them on. He then claims that Oliver Cromwell himself came to see the body, and having opened the coffin in which it had been placed in Whitehall Palace, quote, "...curiously viewed it, and with his fingers severed the head from the shoulders, as we have been informed by eyewitnesses." It was only after this, says Beit, that the body was embalmed, by a rascally quack physician and some surgeons of the army. The strength of Bates' account is that it was written so soon after the events it describes, and he was in a position to be able to talk to those who had dealt with the body. But as for whether or not Cromwell physically interacted with Charles's remains in his coffin, without knowing who the eyewitnesses were who Bates says he spoke to, it's impossible to verify this. The remains certainly were on view in Whitehall Palace for several days, and one who saw them was Sir Purbeck Temple, who recorded that he viewed, quote, The head of the blessed martyred king lie in a coffin with his body, which smiled as perfectly as if it had been alive. 
The exact sequence of events around when and where precisely the body was embalmed, however, varies from source to source, as we'll see. One early but not quite contemporary account is called A Chronicle of England, which was originally written by Sir Richard Baker. Now, Baker actually died in 1645, before King Charles, but his book was later reissued with more up-to-date information added into it, which had been written by a man called Edward Phillips. In the 1660 edition of the Chronicle, it states that after the execution, the masked executioner, whose identity remains uncertain even to this day, held up Charles's head, quote, and showed it to the people. His head and trunk were afterwards coffined in lead and exposed to public view at St. James's, till lastly the Duke of Lennox, the Marquess of Hartford, the Earl of Southampton and the Bishop of London begged the body to bury it, which they conducted to Windsor Chapel Royal and there interred it, with only this inscription upon the coffin, Charles King of England, MDC XL VIII. This means 1648 in Roman numerals because in the Julian calendar in use in England at the time, you didn't switch over to the new year until the end of March, so that's why it's not 1649. There is no explanation as to where this information came from, but 11 years had passed since the execution, so Phillips had had plenty of time to gather up his evidence and may have had access to eyewitnesses, though there had also been plenty of time for errors to be introduced into the story. As the Chronicle went through edition after edition, more and more details about Charles's death were added in, and others were altered. By 1674, it stated that the initial coffin, used straight after the execution, was covered with black velvet, and that the body went to the King's lodgings at Whitehall, which tallies with what Bate and Temple said, before being taken to St James's for embalming, after which it, quote, "...laid there a fortnight to be seen by the people." And on Wednesday seven night after, his corpse, embalmed and coffined in lead, was delivered chiefly to the care of four of his servants, viz. Master Herbert, Captain Anthony Mildmay, his sewers, Captain Preston, and John Joyner, formerly cook to His Majesty, who, with others in mourning, accompanied the hearse that night to Windsor, and placed it in that which was formerly the King's bedchamber whence it was next day removed into the Dean's Hall, and from thence, by the Duke of Richmond, the Marquess of Hereford, the Marquess of Dorchester, and Earl of Lindsay, conveyed to St. George his chapel, and the corpse there interred in the vault, as is supposed, of King Henry the Eighth and Queen Jane, with this inscription upon the coffin, Charles, King of England, MDCXL VIII. As you can see, compared to the 1660 edition, the Chronicle printed in 1674 provides quite a different account of who accompanied the corpse to Windsor, and also says that Charles was not embalmed during the time he lay at Whitehall. This does not match what Dr Bates said, and given the speed with which I think we all know biological material decays at, and the state of preservation the body was in when it was eventually disinterred, and there's a very detailed description of the head coming later when we get to the first exhumation, I think that embalming must have taken place sooner rather than later. Indeed, this suspicion is only strengthened in me given my previous videos on the remains of Henry I and Henry VIII, which provide a stomach-churning insight into what happens when embalming isn't done well. A later source is a book entitled The History of the Rebellion and Civil Wars in England. This was authored by Edward Hyde, Earl of Clarendon, father-in-law of the future James II, and the relevant part of the book was written in the early 1670s, Clarendon died in 1674, but not published until 1702. The Earl stated that embalming only took place after the body had been on show for several days at Whitehall, but he will have been relying on other people's information as he wasn't there himself. In 1678, another source was published, this time written by Sir Thomas Herbert. This is the Master Herbert mentioned by the Chronicle. Herbert was one of the king's attendants during his imprisonment, and just as the Chronicle stated, he ultimately helped to deal with the body all the way through to its burial. He was a sometime parliamentarian, sometime royalist. He got a knighthood from Henry Cromwell in 1658, for instance, and a baronetcy from Charles II in 1660. And this ability to shift sides depending on which way the wind was blowing must be taken into account when reading his description of Charles's body. Given that this description was only written down and published during the reign of Charles II, with later versions appearing in 1691 and 1702 after Herbert's death, a desire to please the then king, 
the almost thirty years which had elapsed since the execution of Charles I, and the fact that he'd possibly read Baker slash Phillips' Chronicle of England or other accounts in the interim and inadvertently influenced his memory by doing so, means that we must be cautious about taking everything he says at face value. Nevertheless, later exhumations of Charles's body would bear out many of his assertions. I haven't been able to get a hold of the original 1678 publication, so I'm using the 1691 one here, which tells us that Herbert said that directly after the king was killed, his body was placed in a coffin and covered with a velvet pall. It was then taken to be embalmed, just as Bates said, in a timeline which makes much more sense than that provided by the Chronicle or Clarendon. When this was done, it was placed back in a coffin, wrapped in lead and placed under a new pall. It was then taken to St James's Palace, where it was put on public view, though Herbert says few had leave to enter or behold it. There then followed discussions about where to bury Charles. The first plan was to place him in the vault of Henry VII in Westminster Abbey. However, when Herbert put this request to the ruling party, it was denied, quote, for this reason, that his burying there would attract infinite numbers of all sorts thither to see where the king was buried, which, as the times then were, was judged unsafe and inconvenient. Attention therefore turned to St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, a more private and secure location outside London. On the 6th of February, permission was given by Parliament for burial in this location to go ahead. The next day, Herbert says, the body was taken to Windsor, quote, in a hearse covered with black velvet, drawn by six horses, covered with black cloth, in which were about a dozen gentlemen. It was first placed in the Dean's house there, which was hung in black for the occasion, then moved to what had been the King's bedchamber in the castle, while it was decided exactly where to put Charles within the chapel. In the meantime, the Duke of Richmond, the Marquess of Hertford, the Earl of Lindsay, and Dr. Juxon, Bishop of London, arrived at Windsor with a, quote, license from the Parliament to attend the King's body to his grave. They decided that the vault containing Henry VIII and his third wife, Jane Seymour, was the best place, and the then unmarked grave was located and opened. Herbert was very specific about where the bodies lay, which will be important later on when we consider how the location of the tomb came to be supposedly lost. He said that, quote, the lords agreeing that the king's body should be in the said vault interred, being about the middle of the choir, over against the eleventh stall upon the sovereign side, they gave order to have the king's name and year he died cut in lead. This very simple inscription was done and was reported as saying only King Charles, 1648. With everything prepared, Charles's body was brought to St George's Hall and, according to Herbert's information, after a little stay, it was, with a slow and solemn pace, much sorrow in most faces being then discernible, carried by gentlemen of quality in mourning. The noblemen in mourning also held up the pall, and the governor with several gentlemen and officers and attendants came after. It was then observed that at such time as the king's body was brought out from St George's Hall, the sky was serene and clear, but presently it began to snow, and the snow fell so fast that by the time the corpse came to the west end of the royal chapel, the black velvet pall was all white, the colour of innocency, being thick covered over with snow. The body being by the bearers set down near the place of burial, the Bishop of London stood ready with the service book in his hands to have performed his last duty to the king his master, according to the order and form of burial of the dead set forth in the Book of Common Prayer, which the lords likewise desired, but would not be suffered by Colonel Witchcott, the governor of the castle, by reason of the directory, to which, said he, he and others were to be conformable. The directory being referred to here is the Directory for Public Worship, which came out in England in 1644, and which replaced the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. So essentially what happened was that Charles's friends wanted to bury him according to the rites of the Anglican Church, and were refused. He had to have a more Puritan burial. If you saw my video on when Christmas was cancelled between 1644 and 1660, you'll have heard me mention the directory there too. As you can see, Herbert's information repeats a lot of what is in the Chronicle, but is ultimately much more detailed than the 1660 and 1674 editions of that work. Funnily enough though, by the time the Chronicle was published in 1733, it had incorporated a lot of Herbert's additional information, 
from the Dean's Hall at Windsor being hung in black to the denial of the use of the Book of Common Prayer. It also now had further details, such as the fact that the funeral was not allowed to exceed £500 in costs. You'll note that none of these sources mention that Charles's head was sewn back onto his corpse, but this is a detail which you'll sometimes see given in discussions of his death and burial. So where did this story come from? Was Charles I's head reattached to his body after death? Well, though it's not impossible, there is no contemporary evidence that this occurred. Instead, the story may be traced to one William Wadd. Wadd was born in 1776, 127 years after Charles's death, and ultimately became the surgeon extraordinary to King George IV. He wrote a book, published in 1824, in which he claimed that the surgeon who embalmed Charles I's body was told, quote, to replace the head, which operation he is said to have performed, not without uttering several coarse jokes and unfeeling expressions. Wad doesn't tell us who said any of this, and so without a real primary source, I don't attach much credit to the story. His entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography also notes that the book in question is littered with errors, so I see no reason to think that the story about Charles's head isn't one of them. The website for St George's Chapel further notes that, quote, Local tradition in Windsor that the king's head was reattached to the body on the great table in the deanery at Windsor, where the coffin rested briefly after its arrival at Windsor Castle, is equally undocumented. And given that the body had surely been embalmed and coffined up by this point, I too think that this story is mere fancy. So Charles had been buried, with or without his head reattached. But what happened next? Well, long story short, after Cromwell died in 1658, the Republican experiment in England quickly fell apart, and in 1660, Charles I's son, Charles II, was invited back to restore the monarchy. But why didn't the king have his father reburied with more pomp and in Westminster Abbey? Lord Clarendon, who was the father-in-law of the new king's brother, James Duke of York, remember, wrote that, Upon the return of King Charles II, it was generally expected that the body should be removed from that obscure burial and, with such ceremony as should be thought fit, should be solemnly deposited with his royal ancestors in King Harry the Seventh's chapel in the Collegiate Church of Westminster. And the king himself intended nothing more and spoke often of it, as if it were only deferred till some circumstances and ceremonies in the doing it might be adjusted. But, by degrees, the discourse of it was diminished, as if it were totally laid aside upon some reasons of state. Clarendon went on to say that there were many theories amongst contemporaries as to why Charles II did not rebury Charles I, then offered what he said was the real explanation, which was that some of those who had been present at the interment were dead by the time the younger Charles returned from exile on the continent or died soon afterwards, and those who survived couldn't remember where they'd buried the body within the chapel. This is a very weak excuse. I ask you, if you'd buried a king in a specific building, which isn't even that big, by the way, as these things go, do you not think you'd remember where you'd put him, even ten years later? Clarendon argued that the interior of the chapel had been slightly altered in the years since, and that this was what confused them, so that, try as they might, they just couldn't locate the vault, despite Herbert's detailed description of where it was, and the fact that the floor was supposedly dug up in several places as they looked for the king. I suspect, and this is just supposition, that Charles II had good intentions, but then just never got around to moving his father, and eventually became apathetic about the whole matter and didn't want to spend his money on a grand funeral. Not wanting to admit this, though, the story was put out that the grave location had been lost. The fact that this is total poppycock, however, is given away by the fact that the location of the tomb was obviously known about in the 1680s or 1690s because one of Queen Anne's infant children was put into it. The Stuart family therefore knew exactly where Charles I was buried by that point at the absolute latest. They just weren't interested in reinterring him anywhere else. See my video on Anne's childbearing record, by the way, to hear all about the many children she tragically lost. Still, the fact that the later Stuarts weren't interested in digging up Charles II and that his remains lay within the walls of one of the royal family's strongest castles meant that he rested undisturbed for many decades. 
From the time Anne's baby was placed in the tomb, it doesn't appear to have been opened again until 1813, by which point there really was some confusion as to where the entrance to this unmarked grave was, because it was only located by accident. Sir Henry Halford, doctor to the then King, George III, and one of those present at the tomb's opening, wrote an account of what happened. Early in that year, a new tomb was being finished which had been ordered by King George, though he was by that point incapacitated by the illness which has led to him being called Mad King George. It was necessary, for some reason, to make a passageway to it from underneath the choir of the chapel, and in so doing, the workmen stumbled across what I'm going to call the Tudor Stuart Vault. When they peered through the little hole they had made in this underground room and saw three adult coffins, it was suspected right away that they had found the final resting places of Henry VIII, Jane Seymour and Charles I, along with the possibly unanticipated remains of Queen Anne's baby. The Prince Regent, the future George IV, was informed, and he ordered that the vault be opened up properly on the 1st of April to see if the suspicions were correct. This was done in his presence and that of his brother, the Duke of Cumberland, as well as Count Munster, the Dean of Windsor, Benjamin Charles Stevenson and Sir Henry Halford, plus of course the unnamed workmen who have done all the grunt work. I'm now going to quote directly from Halford's account, which is dated just 10 days later on the 11th of April, because I don't think I can describe what they found any better than he did. I'll also be showing you a drawing of Charles's head made in 1813, which I don't think is particularly unpleasant, but I wouldn't want anyone saying that they weren't given fair warning. So here we go. The vault is covered by an arch, half a brick in thickness, is 7 feet 2 inches in width, 9 feet 6 inches in length, and 4 feet 10 inches in height, and is situated in the centre of the choir, opposite the 11th knight stall on the sovereign's side. On removing the pall, a plain leaden coffin, with no appearance of ever having been enclosed in wood, and bearing an inscription, King Charles, 1648, in large, legible characters, on a scroll of lead encircling it, immediately presented itself to the view. This, by the way, is not the exact inscription given by the Chronicle of England, but does match what Sir Thomas Herbert said. A square opening was then made in the upper part of the lid, of such dimensions as to admit a clear sight into its contents. These were an internal wooden coffin, very much decayed, and the body carefully wrapped up in cerecloth, into the folds of which a quantity of unctuous or greasy matter mixed with resin, as it seemed, had been melted, so as to exclude, as effectually as possible, the external air. The coffin was completely full, and from the tenacity of the cerecloth, great difficulty was experienced in detaching it successfully from the parts which it enveloped. Wherever the unctuous matter had insinuated itself, the separation of the seer cloth was easy, and when it came off, a correct impression of the features to which it had been applied was observed in the unctuous substance. At length, the whole face was disengaged from its covering. The complexion of the skin of it was dark and discoloured. The forehead and temples had lost little or nothing of their muscular substance, the cartilage of the nose was gone, but the left eye, in the moment of exposure, was open and full, though it vanished almost immediately, and the pointed beard, so characteristic of the period of the reign of King Charles, was perfect. The shape of the face was a long oval. Many of the teeth remained, and the left ear, in consequence of the interposition of the unctuous matter between it and the seer cloth, was found entire. It was difficult at this moment to withhold a declaration that, notwithstanding its disfigurement, the countenance did bear a strong resemblance to the coins, the busts, and especially to the picture of King Charles I by Van Dyck, by which it had been made familiar to us. After asserting that everything Herbert had written had been proved to be true, Halford continued that, when the head had been entirely disengaged from the attachments which confined it, it was found to be loose, and, without any difficulty, was taken up and held to view. Now I know some of you are going to hear that sentence and think the word attachments is the smoking gun that proves the head must have been sewn back onto the body, but that's not really what Halford says, and in fact, had there been evidence that the head had been reattached, such as pieces of string or marks on the skin of the neck, I think he would have said so. Of course, the sewing string could have rotted away by this point, and Halford's description doesn't definitively rule out a reattachment, 
But remember, there's no contemporary evidence to suggest that ever happened, and my reading of this source is that the head was held in place by sear cloth and what I'm going to call coffin goop, meaning embalming fluid and bodily fluids. Halford continued that he found the head to be quite wet, with a substance which, quote, gave a greenish red tinge to paper and to linen which touched it. He says in a footnote, though, that while he personally thought this liquid might have been blood, and so did the others present, he couldn't prove it and, quote, wished to record facts only and not opinions. Halford surmised that despite the embalming, quote, the large blood vessels continued to empty themselves for some time afterwards, which would account for this remaining blood which he thought, quote, gave to writing paper and to a white handkerchief such a colour as blood which has been kept for a length of time generally leaves behind it. He didn't see any moisture in the rest of the coffin, and he thought the weight of the head suggested that the brain was still inside the skull and had not liquefied. Now, to be honest, I've never embalmed a body, human or otherwise, and frankly I hope never to do so, but if any of you have, and can tell the rest of us if any of this sounds remotely plausible, please do let us know in the comments. Halford then continued that, the back part of the scalp was entirely perfect and had a remarkably fresh appearance, the pores of the skin being more distinct as they usually are when soaked in moisture. Again, he can see the king's pores, but he doesn't mention any sewing holes. I just don't think that head had been reattached. And the tendons and ligaments of the neck were of considerable substance and firmness. The hair was thick at the back part of the head and in appearance nearly black. A portion of it, which has since been cleaned and dried, is of a beautiful dark brown colour. That of the beard was a redder brown. On the back part of the head, it was more than an inch in length, and had probably been cut so short for the convenience of the executioner, or perhaps by the piety of friends soon after death, in order to furnish memorials of the unhappy king. This does suggest that the contemporary comments about Charles's hair being cut off as souvenirs in 1649 might have had some truth to them. On holding up the head to examine the place of separation from the body, the muscles of the neck had evidently retracted themselves considerably, and the fourth cervical vertebrae was found to be cut through its substance transversely, leaving the surfaces of the divided portions perfectly smooth and even, an appearance which could have been produced only by a heavy blow inflicted with a very sharp instrument, and which furnished the last proof wanting to identify King Charles I. After this examination of the head, which served every purpose in view, and without examining the body below the neck, it was immediately restored to its situation, the coffin was soldered up again, and the vault closed. If you'd like to hear more about the condition of Henry and Jane's coffins, which Halford also discussed, see my videos linked below for you on their deaths, burials, and exhumations. Hopefully now you can see why I believe Charles was embalmed very soon after death, and exceptionally well embalmed too, it must be said, suggesting that the doctor who did it was no quack. His head was still in such good condition 164 years later that even one of his eyes was intact until it made contact with the air, and I think that had he been left to decompose, even just for a few days initially without embalming, his remains wouldn't have been so well preserved and so easily recognisable. One other thing which I'd like to draw your attention to in Halford's description before we move on is that although he conveniently forgets to mention it, he and the others present defiled the body before they reinterred it, a fact just alluded to by his description of having Charles's hair dried and cleaned, which could only have been done if they'd cut it off. We only know about the extent of this desecration, however, because of events which took place much later in the century. After the 1813 opening of the tomb, a marble floor plaque was eventually installed near it in 1837 by William IV, recording who the occupants were, but for 75 years those occupants lay undisturbed once more. Then, on the 13th of December 1888, the grave was opened for what was to date the last known time. We have an excellent first-hand account written by someone who was actually there that evening and published in the annual report of the Friends of St George's Chapel in 1965. I'm not sure why there was such a long delay. It explains why and how that evening's events proceeded, though unfortunately I'm not sure who the actual author was. To go with it, we have a drawing by Alfred Nutt Young of the condition of the four coffins at that stage. The first-hand account tells us that the vault is situated a few feet in front of the altar steps at St George's, 
and the crown of it is close beneath the pavement of the chapel. When King Charles's coffin was opened in 1813, Sir Henry Halford managed to extract the beard of the king, the vertebra of the neck, which was severed by the executioner's axe, and a toother from the jaw. These relics were subsequently preserved in the family of Sir Henry Halford, and eventually came into the possession of his grandson, who not long ago sent them to the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VII. It was the wish of the prince that the relics should be replaced in the vault from which they had been taken 75 years ago, and he took the opportunity at Windsor this week to carry out his wish. Now let's just stop right here for a minute. Sir Henry Halford, the guy whose lengthy account of the 1813 opening I just read out to you, had not only cut off some of King Charles's beard and hair, he'd also stolen the vertebra from his neck that had been severed by the axe and presumably wrenched out one of his teeth. And I say wrenched because by his own account and the drawing of the head undertaken in 1813, the remains were in excellent condition, with most of the tendons and flesh still in place. There's no indication whatsoever that Charles's teeth were lying loose, not that it would have been okay to steal one of them if it had been. Furthermore, if you've ever seen the documentary on the discovery of Richard III's remains, even getting one of his teeth out to run DNA on it was apparently a difficult and fraught process, and there wasn't even any flesh left on his bones. To make matters worse, I can't see how the others present in 1813, including the Prince Regent and his brother, didn't notice what Halford was doing, and this makes me wonder if they were all at it, stealing bits of Charles's corpse for their own perverted pleasure and to show off to guests. This concern is only heightened by the fact that there's a story, which I haven't been able to verify, that Halford used the vertebra as, wait for it, a salt cellar. If true, that would be the ultimate act of disrespect, but whether it happened or not, I find even, just in inverted commas, the stealing of someone's bones for personal gain to be depraved. Imagine if someone did that to one of your deceased ancestors, or to you. Anyway, now that I've had my little rant against body snatchers, let's continue with the account of the 1888 opening of the vault. The relics were placed in the hands of the dean, who had a suitable case of lead made for them, with an inscription saying what they were, how they came to be taken away, and that they were replaced by the Prince of Wales. The prince also himself wrote a few lines to the same effect on a sheet of notepaper which was placed inside the case. I saw the relics at the deanery before the case was finally closed. The king's beard was of a brown colour, short and rather curled at the end. It was wrapped in a piece of paper which he apparently got from the Dean of Windsor, who was called John Dalton, whose name was on it. The vertebra of the neck was cut clean through by the axe or sword of the executioner. The tooth was an eye tooth. These relics, as I have said, were placed in a leaden case, which was prepared for them, and the leaden case was then screwed down in a wooden box about a foot square in size. As soon as the five o'clock evensong was over in the chapel, it was dark in December, and the lights were all put out, the work of opening the vault was commenced. The Dean, Canon Dalton and myself were present, and three workmen under the direction of Nutt, our chapter architect. The doors of the chapel were locked to prevent any intrusion, and the work was carried out by the light of a few candles. Portion of the pavement having been removed, we came immediately to the crown of the vault, and in this a square hole was carefully made. We then tied two candles to the end of a long stick, which was put down into the vault. The four coffins were at once clearly seen. Henry VIII lay in the centre, and on his left lay Queen Jane Seymour a little way off. On his right, quite close, was King Charles and lying at the foot of his coffin was the tiny coffin of Queen Anne's infant. We made a close examination of all we could see. The outer wooden coffin of Queen Jane had quite fallen away, but the leaden coffin was perfect and unimpaired. Henry VIII's coffin of wood was quite destroyed. The inner coffin of lead was all open at the top so that I could see into it, and there lay the bones and skull of the king as they had been lying for 350 years. I did not see the whole of the skeleton, as it was partially covered by the pieces of the wooden coffin which had fallen across it, but I saw many of the bones and skull. King Charles's coffin was quite uninjured, but then it had been restored somewhat in 1813, and it was still covered with the black velvet pall which had been placed over it at the time of the funeral. There was also a broad band of lead across it on which the date was clearly cut, 1648. At half-past seven, the Prince of Wales arrived, quite unattended. 
He first shook hands with us, and then going down on his hands and knees, he looked into the vault while we held the candle for him and pointed out the different coffins to him. He spent some time looking in and was greatly interested, as he could not fail to be. The box with relics was brought to him, and again going down on his hands and knees, he let it down by a handkerchief until it rested on the coffin of King Charles, where it was left. He then remained talking to us for a few minutes longer, and before he left, he requested that we would see the vault securely locked again. As soon as he was gone, the workmen, who had been sent away, were brought back, and the vault was then closed in our presence, after which the pavement was replaced over it. So there you have it, history lovers. The last time the Tudor Stuart Vault in St George's Chapel, Windsor, was opened. From that day to this, unless another opening has been done very quietly indeed, the four occupants of the tomb have once again rested in peace. That also brings us to the end of the story of Charles I's corpse, a body that was treated with surprising respect by the parliamentarians, who actually ensured he had what amounted to a lying in state, a good embalming, an expensive coffin, and a decent interment in a royal chapel attended by his friends and servants. In fact, Charles's remains were, in many ways, treated with less respect by his family, from his eldest son, who said he wanted to rebury him but never actually did so, to his other children and grandchildren, who went along with the story that the grave was lost, even though it was clearly used by them in the 1680s or 1690s to inter one of Charles's great-grandchildren with him. Later members of the royal family did even worse, allowing his remains to be desecrated in 1813, though the future Edward VII did show some human decency, ensuring that at least some of the pieces of Charles's body stolen from his coffin were returned. Thank you to my patrons and to those of you who donate to the channel using the thanks button underneath videos, as your kindness helps to make YouTube a viable career for me so that I can keep producing these videos for you. If anyone is interested in becoming a patron and getting access to some history calling perks, do check out the link in the description box below. Let me know in the comments too what you make of the treatment of Charles I's corpse, from death to disinterments, and if you'd like to learn more about famous dead body stories, try my playlist on death, murder and corpses next. I'll be back next week with something new for you, and until then, keep learning.